All right, this is CS50. Harvard University's introduction to the intellectual enterprises of computer science and the arts of programming, and for the first time in history, Yale universities as well. Indeed, whether you're here in Cambridge or in New Haven or Miami or St. Louis or Amsterdam or anywhere around the world taking CS50, Computer Science E50, CS50X, CS50 AP, we are all one and the same. Welcome to CS50. What we have... <laughs> So I made a mistake myself some time ago when I started off college, and I got to college and I decided to, frankly, stick within my comfort zone. I ended up declaring a concentration or a major of government, and that was mostly a function of me being pretty familiar with government, or at least history, or I really liked constitutional law in high school. And so when I got here, I kind of gravitated toward things with which I was already familiar, right? God forbid I, I do poorly in the class. I certainly wanted to stay within my comfort zone, and it wasn't until sophomore year that I finally got up the nerve to step foot in a classroom called CS50. And at that point, did I finally realize that, my God, homework could actually be fun. Indeed, I was one of those kids that on Friday evenings when the P sets would be released, I would go back to my room and dive into the night's P sets. And for me, that was a sign that this was a field for me. But what was more important was the fact that I did get up this nerve to explore waters unfamiliar to me and get beyond my own comfort zone. And frankly, I only was able to do that sophomore year by taking this class pass-fail. Indeed, it was the very last day that I finally switched over and finally declared CS as my concentration, putting Gov at that point behind me. And so we're not setting out in this course to turn all of you into CS majors or concentrators, but rather to give you an opportunity to hopefully go beyond with that, uh, the world with which you're currently familiar and bring back from this world skills and knowledge and savvy that you can apply to your own world, whether that's in the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, or beyond. Indeed, if you're feeling a little intrepid about being in this room, let alone in this class, realize that if the history is any indication, 72% of you have never taken a CS course before. So it is by all means not the case that the student sitting to the left or to the right or in front or behind you has no, has knows far more about CS or programming in particular than you. That's not, in fact, the case. And indeed, much of the support structure that we've set up in this course over 
the past many years has been for exactly that reason, to provide an on-ramp that still exits just as rigorously and just as high as ever, but the slope of which allows students less comfortable and more comfortable alike to succeed irrespective of his or her prior background. Indeed, what ultimately matters in this class is not so much where you end up relative to your classmates, but where you in week 12 end up relative to yourself in week zero, which is where we're here today. Indeed, this may very well and probably does look like Greek to many of you, but rest assured that this and so much more is going to be completely uh, within your grasp in just a little bit of time. But today, we focus on some of the higher level ideas to give you a taste of CS50 and computer science and a sense of what you're signing up for. And indeed, computer science might be distilled more simply as computational thinking, thinking like a computer, if you will. And there's so many different ingredients that go into that, but let's propose just three for today. If the goal of the class ultimately is not to teach you programming is not to teach you C or PHP or SQL or any number of the words and acronyms in the course's description, but rather to teach you to solve problems more effectively and to think more methodically and more algorithmically, so to speak. Let's see what exactly this means. So I would propose that thinking computationally boils down to solving problems. What do you need to solve a problem? You need an input, like the input to the problem. You need an output, which is hopefully the solution. And then you need a process by which to solve that problem, which we'll call an algorithm, a set of instructions for solving some problem. But first, let's focus on the first and the last of these, inputs and outputs. Computers, after all, apparently only understand zeros and ones. But how can that possibly be? Even if you're not familiar at all with what's underneath the hood, you've probably at least heard the computers understand binary, just zeros and ones, but how can you possibly do anything interesting? Well, one of the themes of the class is going to be this layering, where today we'll take a quick glance at the lowest level of details, but with each passing day, will we layer or abstract on top of those details to actually solve higher level problems of interest to us. So here is what we might call binary, with just an alphabet of zero and one, but we humans are mostly familiar with decimal. Dec meaning 10, bi meaning two, and so in the decimal system, we have 10 digits at our disposal, of course, zero through nine. So if you look at a number like this, most of you intuitively just grasp that as 123. There's nothing really hard about that, but why is it 123? Well, if you think back to grade school, or at least the way I learned this kind of world, you might recall that we treated these things in columns or places. So we had the ones place on the right, the tens place in the middle, the hundreds place on the left, and then how do we get from this pattern of symbols, one, two, three, to this higher level idea that we know as 123, well, it's just some simple arithmetic, right? The one there is essentially means give us 100 times one, plus 10 times 2, plus 1 times 3. And of course, if we do out the math there, it's 100 plus 20 plus 3, otherwise known as 123. So if you're on the same page as that right now and are comfortable with the so-called decimal system as a human, it's actually well within your scope of comfort to consider now the binary system. Take a wild guess. This represents, in the world of computers and binary, what number? Zero. But why is that? Well, it turns out that the columns or places here, they're not powers of 10, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, and so forth. They're instead, quite simply, powers of 2. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. And so now we, of course, get to zero here simply because we have 4 times 0 plus 2 times 0 plus 1 times 0, which, of course, gives us zero. But how do I go about representing the number 1? What's the pattern of zeros and 1s to represent the number we humans know as 1? Zero, zero, 001 and 2 zero, 010 zero. and now the pattern starts to repeat now it's zero, 011 one, one. and again zero fours 1 2 1 1 so 2 plus 1 that's 3 and now to represent 4 we don't just change that zero to a 1 you sort of have to carry so to speak and the numbers start flipping around just like in the decimal world so this is 4 this is 5 this is 6 this is 7 and so we've counted as high as seven. Now all we just need is more bits, more zeros and ones, and indeed bits, if you've heard this term, binary digit, bit is where that comes from. And so if we want to represent bigger numbers, we need more bits, but let's move away from slides now to something a little more real. Suppose that we want to actually represent this thing. Well, let's take a look now at a little demonstration. So this is a, a web-based application that one of CS50's own TFs, Michael G, put together this summer to help us elucidate exactly this idea. And would someone like to venture up on stage in front of all of his or her classmates? Right, right there in front, come on up. You have to be comfortable on camera and the internet. <laughs> oh, right, uh, right here. OK, we're OK. All right, come on up. What's your name? Emily, come on up. So this is Emily. What year are you? 
Freshman, Emily, nice to meet you, David. All right, so up on the screen here, we have this touch screen, which is going to allow us to actually interact with this program. And it's just a browser. It's Chrome full screened at the moment. But it's been programmed by Michael to respond in a way that allows us to play around with binary digits. So for instance, here we have not three, but eight bits, zeros and ones. Right now, we're looking at the number zero. And indeed, all eight zeros in decimal mean zero. So that's all that's being hinted at here. So if you wanted to represent the number eight, What's the pattern of zeros and ones that you want? And you can simply tap up or down or the numbers themselves. Right All right, so that, of course, is eight, as you can see up there. And if we wanted to do 16, what do we do? Can you change that back to yep, just type it again. 16. All right. So this is all fine and good, but it's still very low level. We need a way in the real world for Emily of actually representing these things. And so suppose that we turn these zeros and ones, which is very conceptual, into actual light bulbs, right? A computer is a physical, mechanical, electrical device. And its input, at least if you plug it in or charge it, is to have battery power and electrons flowing in and out. So now, why don't we stop thinking about bits as zeros and ones, but something more physical like light bulbs here? And if Dan Armendariz could join me for just a moment, Moment. Come on up. We're going to queue up an application. Come on over here, Emily. Sorry, this is the most awkward demo for you ever. Come on, come on over here. <laughs> We're going to queue up, with thanks to Dan Armendariz, another member of our staff, an application known as Binary Bulb. So what we have here is an iPad application that has the following user interface on the screen for Emily. It's just got the same exact UI, essentially, that's over there. And if you now want to represent the number, say, 8, how would you go about doing this? Noticing at the right the light bulbs that we have here. Aha! Magical. So if we want to now turn this into something a little more challenging, and let's go ahead and pick a random number, like the number 50 here, input this. And if you can now be challenged to come up with the number 50, we'll have a fabulous prize for you. Okay. <laughs> Arithmetic is indeed hard in front of hundreds of your classmates. But 50 has been the answer here. And so now, this is meant to be demonstrative for Emily. So in here is some light bulbs quite like these, but it's actually the little magnetic strips. And what's cool about these, and the reason we use them in CS50, is that they support something called an API, an application programming interface, which is just a fancy way of saying that what one of our staff did over the summer was create an iPad application here that talks over the internet to the light bulbs over here, which are wirelessly connected to another device. But this is now an option for final projects. And so Emily, if you would so like, at the end of the term, you can adorn your dorm room in the meantime with those. Thank you to Emily. As Wow. But now let's turn our attention to um, what that message might have looked like. And it's a little something like this. In fact, this is an example, just as a teaser of what's to come, of what's called an API request. And so what we have here is simply the, exactly the kinds of message that after a few weeks' time in CS50, you'll be able to send to something fairly familiar like that to actually turn them on and off. But this is all fine and good, right? We have the mental model, hopefully, for representing numbers with zeros and ones. And from zeros and ones, we can get to higher numbers, like 50, as Emily just did. Or we can move up from that. That, and I claim that we can represent things like letters as well. Right? Computers are far more interesting than just numbers. And so how do you go about representing words on the screen, or emails, or essays, or the like? Well, it turns out that computers simply abstract on top of these low-level details. And humans, some time ago, came up with an arbitrary but a consistent mapping of numbers to letters, so that any time you see a capital letter A on your computer screen, odds are what's underneath the hood is a pattern of zeros and ones that represent the number, per this chart, 65. And more physically, inside of your computer are millions of things called transistors these days, which are just switches, if you will, things that can go on and off. And so imagine not eight of these large light bulbs, but millions of these tiny little light bulbs or switches or transistors that can turn on and off based on how you program them. And so now we have a way of representing letters as well. In fact, if we were to use this mapping here and try to actually spell something out, we might look at this pattern of decimal digits right now. So we're not going to even focus on binary anymore. Let's just consider these as decimal numbers, 72, 73, 33. But what might this represent? Anyone have a sufficiently photographic memory to know what's spelled on the screen here? Yeah, a few. So hi, H-I, and then an exclamation point, which was not 
actually on the screen. But indeed, there's a mapping for every letter to every number that you might want to type on your keyboard. But numbers don't have to represent just letters, right? All of us know about images and photographs and, and audio files and video files and the like. So clearly, we can represent higher level things still. And so, what a computer does is simply choose to interpret patterns of zero ones differently. Based on the context. If you double click a Microsoft Word icon, you see words on the screen instead of colors and pictures because Word knows that this is an essay that you've actually typed. If you instead double click on a JPEG or a GIF or a ping, it opens up and is an image because the .png or the .docx or whatever the file extension is and whatever software you're using knows to interpret a pattern of zeros and ones differently. Based on what its purpose in life is. So, for instance, this same sequence of numbers might represent how much red do you want, how much green do you want, and how much blue do you want. And indeed, if you've ever heard RGB, RGB, this is just red, green, blue. And so, if I see numbers like this, give me 72 red, give me 73 green, and 33 blue, this is how a computer using three bytes. Where a byte is 8 bits or 24 bits would represent a pretty nasty shade of brown or yellow here. And in different contexts, could those exact same patterns and zeros and ones mean something completely different as well? So we have now a way of representing information zeros and ones. On top of that, we get letters. On top of that, we might get colors. And let's assume for today that we can get audio and video and things so much more sophisticated than that. But now let's consider how we use those inputs and produce those outputs now that we have a way of representing that information. Well, we need something called an algorithm. Again, a set of instructions for solving some problem step by step. And the more precise, the better. And so, an example with which humans are admittedly less familiar these days, but nonetheless is still with us in software. It's the process of looking up someone in a phone book.、Uh, now, fewer and fewer folks know each year what this relic actually is here, but back in my day, this was a phone book with thousands of pages and numbers and people's names from A through Z. And even though we're kind of cheating a bit, since this is mostly yellow pages, there were also white pages at the time which had all of those names and numbers of actual human beings. And if I wanted to look someone up in a phone book like this today, of course, I just type in the few, first few characters of his or her name, and my phone finds that information. But the process by which your iPhone or Android phone or whatever is actually finding someone in your contacts list is identical to what we humans probably have done for some time. Now, I could take this problem, if you will, and the inputs here are not zeros and ones, they're pages, like let's say a thousand pages. And if I wanted to look up someone like Mike Smith in this phone book, I could start at the beginning and see that I'm in the A section and then turn one page at a time. Looking and looking as I make to the B's and the C's and the D's and so forth for Mike Smith. Smith starting with an S, I'll hopefully eventually find him. Is this algorithm, that process, correct? Yeah, it's correct. I will find Mike if he's in here, but what's the caveat that you might offer? It's slow, right? I know Mike S is sort of toward the latter half of the phone book. Why the heck am I starting at the beginning and going page by page by page? So, of course, I could flip it around and start from the back, but that's going to get me there at the same rate, if you will, page after page after page. And it's not going to work if I want to search for someone else whose, letter,、uh, whose name comes earlier in the alphabet. So, what if I do what I learned in grade school? Again, do things not by ones, but by twos. So, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and so forth. Is that correct? No, it's kind of correct, but some of you who murmured no, where's the problem or the bug, the mistake, so to speak? Yeah. Yeah, I might skip over Mike Smith if because I've taken two pages at once and he just happens to be sandwiched between those two pages, I might realize that I'm on to the T section not having found. Mike Smith yet. And so, what the, might the fix be there be? Well, if I do hit the T's in the phone book, I might need to double back one or so page. So, it's fixable, but it's not quite as simple as just going by two to speed up my performance. But what, come on, what is most human, what most humans are going to do with this kind of phone book? You get, you're given the phone book, what do you do? So, what's that? Go to the middle. So, I heard go to the middle, and I find myself roughly in the M section, so to speak. And now, what do I want to do? <laughs> Good job. <laughs> what's your name? James. James. All right, what do I do next? Oh, I'm going to go to the half that has the S's in it because, again, a stipulation here was that this thing is sorted. It's a pretty useless thousand pages if Verizon doesn't actually sort these things for us A through Z. So if I know Mike is probably in the latter half of the phone book, I can now <laughs> tear the problem in half. <laughs> Thank you. Tear the problem in half. 
that was actually real, that struggle. So、uh, tear the phone book in half, leaving myself with fundamentally the same problem, but of course half as large. And if I follow James's advice again and I go here, I say, oh, now I'm in the T section. And so of course I can tear the phone book in half one more time. Leaving me with a problem that's now a quarter of the size. So I've gone from 1,000 to 500 to 250 to 125, and so forth. Feels like I'm taking bigger bites out of this problem with each、uh, iteration or each step in it. And indeed, the time I'm going to spend finding Mike Smith in this example is so much less because eventually I'm going to whittle this phone book down to just one lone page. And if Mike is on that page, I'm going to go ahead and give him a call, having found him. But just how much better is that algorithm? That dare say intuitive algorithm than the ones we started with, which were very linear, left to right, at a pace of one or two x. Well, let's plot this. We don't have to worry too much about math or numbers in this case. Here we just look at a, a plot. So on the x or horizontal axis is the size of the problem. How many pages are there? On the y or the vertical axis is how much time is it going to take me to solve it? And maybe that's how many page turns, how many seconds, how many some unit of measures. And I've drawn a red straight line here. Because if each additional page of the phone book, I'm required to make one additional step. So if Verizon adds one more page next year, I might have to flip one more page to find someone like Mike Smith. Meanwhile, the second algorithm, in which I went by twos, is the same shape. It's still very linear, very left to right, taking equal bytes each time, but the slope is a little lower. For instance, if I were to take、um, if I were to take a、uh, if the size of the problem were roughly here. And I use my first algorithm, I might end up all the way at the top of that red line. But if I instead use the Tuzi's approach, the yellow line suggests because it's lower that it's going to take me less time to solve. But what's the shape of the third algorithm? Again, arguably the most intuitive algorithm. Well, it looks a little something like this. It's curved or logarithmic in shape, and even though it never kind of flattens out, it asymptotically inches up and up and up and up, but terribly slowly versus everything else. And what's the takeaway? Well, we call it log n, but what does that actually mean? Well, if Verizon doubled the number of pages in the phone book next year, from 1,000 to 2,000, how many more steps is my first algorithm going to take? My first algorithm, maybe a thousand more steps. If they doubled the phone book, I'm going to have to flip through another thousand pages to find Mike. Of course, if the second algorithm, maybe 500, because I'm going twice as fast. But if Verizon doubles the number of pages between this year and next, with my third algorithm, the divide and conquer that James proposed, going in half and half and half, how many more steps will it take me next year to have a phone book of size 2,000? Just one, because with one byte, I can take out of that problem half of the pages away. And if you think about this a little crazily now, if the phone book doesn't have like a thousand or two thousand pages, but let's say four billion pages, it's a big phone book. How many times or how many steps is it going to take me to find Mike Smith in the phone book with four billion pages? You can sort of start to do the math, right? Four billion divided by two—that's、so、two billion divided by one—that's one billion, then half a billion, then 250. So you can do this again and again, but not that many times before you get to one page. And indeed, even if the phone book is four billion pages long, or the database you're searching is four billion records long, it's going to take you, give or take, 32 steps only to find Mike Smith. And if you double the phone book next year from four billion to eight billion. 33 steps instead of just 32, and this is testament to one of the ideas that we might embrace in computer science more generally, which is this this computational thinking and approaching a problem, frankly, using tools from your already familiar toolkit, your real world with which you're familiar, but harnessing those ideas to actually solve problems. But we need to formalize our solutions to these problems, and so let me introduce for a moment something we might call pseudocode. Much of the semester we'll spend using actual code in languages like C and PHP and JavaScript and SQL and the like, but for now, let's just look at something fairly intuitive, like English. I might distill that algorithm with which I found Mike into steps like this: pick up phone book, open the middle of phone book, look at the names. If Mike is among the names, call Mike. Else, if Smith is earlier in the book, open to the middle of the left half of the book. Else, go to line three. Else, if Smith is later in the book, open to the middle of the right half of the book. Go to line three. Else, give up. And there's a few characteristics now of this that are worth pointing out. So one, all of the lines I've highlighted in yellow, we're going to start calling statements or functions or procedures. They're just actions. Do this, and there's not all that much variability to it. Next step here, though, are these conditions: if, else, else if, else. And these are called conditions or branches, and they're decision points, and they allow us to do something conditionally. And in fact, let's take a quick look at perhaps a familiar face. We'll call him Bill. And exactly. 
exactly what these conditions, how these might be used. People make decisions every day. Uh, for example, before you go outside, you kind of have an if statement that says, if it's raining, then I need to get my jacket. And computers are amazing once you decide those kinds of statements that they can reliably execute those things at unbelievable speed. And so a computer program really uh, is a little bit of math and some if statements uh, where the decision gets made. So now let's focus on a few different lines, the ones I've highlighted in yellow here. And it turns out there's different ways of expressing this idea. But intuitively, what are lines 8 and 11 that I've highlighted here telling you to do? Yes, go to line 3, but what behavior is that really inducing? It's some kind of loop or cycle, and you can kind of see it, right? If on line 8 you go back to line 3, and then you hit line 8 again, you might go back to line 3, back to line 3, back to line 3. There's this sort of cycle or loop. And indeed, that's induced in line 11 potentially as well. And this is a basic programming construct as well. You might not want to just do something with a statement or do something conditionally with a condition or branch. You might want to do something cyclically with a loop. And we'll have someone else with whom you might be familiar, we'll call him Mark, explain this concept here. One thing that computers are really good at is repeating commands. As a person, you'd get really bored if you had to do the same thing lots of times in a row. But a computer can do the same thing millions or even billions of times and not get bored and be able to carry that out really well. So for example, if I wanted to wish everyone on Facebook a happy birthday by sending them an email, it might take me more than a century to actually write out all of those emails to everyone. But with just a few lines of code, I can have a system send an email to everyone on Facebook wishing them a happy birthday. So that's what loops are and why they're valuable and something that computers can do very well. So many thanks to our friends at Code.org for those two films. And just last week, you might have seen that Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook posted this announcement, which is that they just passed an important milestone for the first time ever. One billion people used Facebook in a single day. Specifically last Monday, one in seven humans on Earth apparently logged into Facebook. Well, this seems a, a good uh, opportunity to look back on where Facebook began. And we went through CS50's own archives, because it turns out in 2005, Mark gave a guest lecture in CS50. Um, you'll see see that uh, production uh, values weren't quite the same back then in terms of the technology available. And you also see that uh, the presence of this guest lecture didn't necessarily pique the interest of the student body, your predecessors, um, as much as it might have just a few years later. So let's take a look at Science Center C. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming. Yo. All right, cool. This is the first time I ever I've had to hold one of these things, so I'm just going to attach it really quickly. One second. All right. All right. Um, can you hear? Is this good? Is this amplified at all? All right, sweet. So, um, you know, this is like one of the first times I've been to a lecture at Harvard, um, but. Um, <laughs> So eventually, the Science Center did zoom in on the video, um, but not before capturing this excerpt from Mark's talk in which he discussed his roommate, uh, Dustin, who had wanted to lend a hand with this site called the Facebook.com and realized that the Mark is about to mention two programming languages, one called Perl, one called PHP, as he discusses the origins of Dustin's contribution. We started, I started writing the site, and um, launched it at Harvard in February 2004, so I guess almost two years ago now. And within a couple of weeks, a few thousand people had signed up, and we started getting some emails from people at other colleges asking for us to launch it at their schools. And I was taking 161 at the time, so I don't know if you guys know like the reputation of that course, but it, I mean, it was kind of heavy. Um, it was a really fun course, but it didn't leave me with much time to do anything else with Facebook. So my roommate, Dustin, who I guess had just finished CS50, was like, hey, I, I want to help out. I want to do the expansion and, like, and help you figure out how to do the stuff. So I was like, you know, that's pretty cool, dude, but you don't really know any PHP or anything like that. So that weekend he went home, bought the book Perl for Dummies, came back and was like, all right, I'm ready to go. I was like, dude, the site's written in PHP, not Perl, but, you know, that's cool. So he picked up PHP um, over, you know, like a few days, because I promise that if you have a good background in C, like, PHP is a very simple thing to pick up. And, um, and he just kind of went to work. 
Before we take a look now at where the course is going, allow me to invite just some of CS50's staff up on the stage. Some of them are shopping their own courses, but if those TFs and CAs and course heads who are here could come on up and join me for a quick hello, allow me to introduce in particular Hannah, Maria, Davin, and Rob, CS50's course heads here in Cambridge. Indeed, testament to the support structure that the course has built out over the past many years. CS50 staff this year numbers nearly 100, and that's here in Cambridge alone. Meanwhile, in New Haven, are there some 40 TFs and CAs and staff members there to run the course as well? Allow us to introduce first Rob Bowden. Hi, I'm Rob. Uh, this is my sixth year TFing the course. Uh, so. All the way back in my freshman year, I did not take CS50. Uh, you might, your freshman fall, you might uh, be familiar that you can only take four courses, and there are so many courses to take, so I'm like, eh. I took APCS my senior year of high school, it was horrible, so I'm like, eh, computer science is not for me. So then it was over the course of my freshman fall that I had a friend in CS50, and uh, I think I attended one lecture with her, it's like, oh, this is, you know, kind of better than what I had in high school. Uh, and over the course of the year, I had my own problem sets in the courses I was actually taking, but I found that whenever I wanted to procrastinate on those, I would go back to CS50 and look at some of that stuff. Uh, so yeah, I'm cool, I procrastinate with coding. Uh, so then it's at the end of the fall that I realized, hey, you know, computer science is pretty cool, I end up taking CS51. Uh, in the spring, I, or in the next semester, I end up taking CS61, and it all from there, then I end up declaring computer science, which I had absolutely no intention of doing when I came into college, and now I'm here. <laughs> so uh, the course is what you make of it. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you to Rob. <laughs> and now Maria, our head course assistant. Hey guys, uh, my name is Maria. I am a sophomore in Cabot House, coming from Bulgaria, and I am super excited to be part of the staff this year. I took CS50 as a freshman last year, and I never even thought about CS beforehand, so I absolutely love the course, and I hope you all love it as much as I did. And yeah, welcome to CS50. Thank you to Maria. <laughs> now, Hannah, our head teaching fellow. I'm Hannah, um, I'm a senior in Cabot uh, studying computer science. Um, I took CS50 as a freshman and have been TFing. This will be my third year, um, so I will be happily involved in CS50 for all four years. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. Thank you to Hannah. <laughs> and lastly, Davin, our preceptor. Hey guys, I'm a preceptor of computer science here. This will be my fourth year teaching. I also help manage the course, so I'm sure you'll see me around, especially at office hours. I'm always at office hours. So if you see me walking around, definitely come say hi. I love to meet everybody. Otherwise, have fun, and I'll see you around. Thank you to Davin as well. So you'll meet all of these folks um, before long, but without further ado, if you guys would like to resume your seats from earlier, allow me to introduce from afar now some of our friends from New Haven. Um, in particular, the course's heads will be overseeing CS50 there, Professor Brian Scazzolati, Jason, and Andy, who just so that we didn't tempt fate with any FaceTime or the like, have just sent us minutes ago the following video in which they say hello from the lecture hall at Yale, in which lecture is being streamed right now. So our friends from Yale. Hi David, hi everyone at Harvard. We are so excited to be bringing CS50 to Yale this semester. My name is Brian Scasolati, but everyone just calls me SCAS. And I'm here today to introduce to you the CS50 staff. Hi. <laughs> and more importantly, I'm here to introduce as well all of the students at Yale who, as of this morning, have made this the most popular course at Yale, the CS50 students. So we're very excited to be seeing you here on Friday and on Saturday for Puzzle Day and uh, have a great lecture. Bye.
On the screen here is the names of the some 140 staff members who await you over the course of the semester. Some of them here in Cambridge, some of them here in New Haven. And indeed, you'll have an opportunity this Saturday at Skaz Notes to attend CS50 Puzzle Day. You might have seen little puzzle pieces slipped under your doorways. Recently, we have a few extras here later on when you exit. If you assemble all four puzzle pieces and merge forces with rooms nearby yours in your house or dorm, they'll assemble into a QR code or a two-dimensional barcode that once assembled and scanned with your phone, uh, will lead you to some fabulous prize, or well, I suppose you could just photograph this now as well. But find those puzzle pieces <laughs> nonetheless in order to win that fabulous prize. And indeed, one of the traditions in CS50, oh, too slow. One of the traditions in CS50 is to serve cake after the first lecture. And so indeed, in a few minutes from now, there will be cake served outside both here and in New Haven as well. But first, we decorated them ourselves. But first, and hopefully there'll be enough. Um, but first, a quick look. So lectures, indeed, will be produced mostly here in Cambridge, but each month we'll hop down to Yale with CS50's production team and stream the course in the reverse direction as well, so as to bring these two campuses truly for the first time in history as close together as possible as one and the same course. In terms of the support structure that's been stood up here in Cambridge as well as in New Haven are sections. Indeed, as some of you may know, we have different tracks within the course for those less comfortable, more comfortable, and somewhere in between, so that irrespective, of your prior background, can you ultimately succeed in the class? Office hours, meanwhile, are an opportunity on Mondays and Tuesdays and Thursday evenings to work both here and in New Haven on courses problem sets with dozens of the course's staff near you. Problem sets, meanwhile, Problem sets, meanwhile, are supported by things we call walkthroughs, which are video-based tutorials that truly answer the FAQ of where to begin a week's challenge. And postmortems walk you through possible solutions so that at the end of the problem set two, you know exactly what you could have done differently or altogether otherwise. The problem sets themselves come in two editions. A standard edition that we expect and invite most of the class, some 90% plus to do, and a so-called hacker edition on which every page is emblazoned. Hacker edition, hacker edition, hacker edition, so that you have that, um, that, that karma, if you will, for diving into more advanced versions of the course's problem sets that cover ostensibly the same material, but with a more uh, sophisticated approach and with additional uh, background uh, sometimes introduced. Meanwhile, are there nine late days that you can apply to the course's problem sets as well as the lowest score, which we drop at term's end. But what awaits? Well, a taste of the problem sets at hand on Friday and next week, we'll we dabble for just a few days in something called Scratch, a graphical programming language developed by our friends at MIT's Media Lab that allows you to program either for the first time or in a new environment altogether using a drag and drop type environment, whereby puzzle pieces only interlock together if it makes logical sense to do so. Meanwhile, in problem set two last year, for instance, did we introduce the class to the world of cryptography, the art of encrypting or scrambling information. Indeed, this text here, if decrypted, will actually lead you to some fun destination. And in the problem set, what we had students do is implement exactly those kinds of things, an algorithm or set of instructions for scrambling and unscrambling information. And in the hacker edition of that same problem set, did we challenge students to take an encrypted file from a typical computer system with lots of usernames and encrypted passwords and to crack those passwords, actually figure out what they were without knowing anything a priori about those actual passwords. Meanwhile, do we transition in the problem sets to then looking at the world of graphics? And in fact, you might imagine now that this could perhaps be the simplest way to represent a black and white image. A white, uh, a white pixel or square, as at top right there, might be represented with a 1, and a black square might be represented with a 0. And just by using more bits, like we proposed earlier with 72 and 73 and 33, could we represent color pixels as well? And what we do during this problem set is generally take a stroll around campus with a digital camera, take photographs of people, places, and things. Then somehow every semester we seem to accidentally delete or corrupt to the memory card on which all of those photos are. And so you are challenged to then write software with which to recover those JPEGs from a copy of our camera's card. Meanwhile, do we hand you later in the term a dictionary of English words that have 143,000 words, and you need to come up with a smart way of loading them into memory, or RAM, so to speak, to answer queries of the form, is this a word, is this a word, implementing the fastest spell checker that you can, even pitting yourself potentially against classmates to see which of you uses the least amount of time when running your code and even the least amount of memory. Later in term, do you actually implement your own web server? So not just a website in a language called HTML and more, but a web server that actually listens to 
requests on the internet and responds to them. And indeed, this is how we bridge our world of C, with which you'll become familiar next week, and PHP, and HTML, and JavaScript, and CSS, and the like. Because one of the first web based projects that we do later in the term. Is historically CS50 Finance, an eTrade.com style website that allows you to buy and sell stocks virtually while also writing code to talk to Yahoo Finance, getting semi real、uh, time stock quotes in order to update your own portfolio. But lastly, of course, is the final project, an opportunity to do most anything of interest to you, to solve a problem here or beyond of interest to you that's somehow、uh, inspired by the lessons learned in the class. And the class, as you may know, culminates in the so called CS50 Hackathon and CS50 Fair, and any number of other cultural and events、uh, throughout the semester that allow you to engage with each other and the course's staff. For instance, at Fire and Ice in Sitar this year, well, on Friday afternoons, we invite some 50 students to lunch, whoever would like to join us, myself and the staff, and our friends from industry and alums,、um, to chat about life in the real world and beyond while enjoying a good lunch. At the Hackathon, well, you see such images as these, including plenty of candy, and as of 2014, for the first time, vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> But by 5 a.m., does the scene usually look a little something like this? And then just a week or so later is the CS50 Fair, to which some 2,000 plus students and staff and faculty members from across campus and across campuses this year、uh, come to see and delight in the accomplishments of CS50 students, which is now you. And indeed, while this year we'll be inviting and busing anyone at Yale who would like to come up to Cambridge this Saturday for CS50 Puzzle Day, and we will do the exact same thing in December for, December for the CS50 Hackathon so that Harvard and Yale students alike partake. In both of these events, we will also hold CS50 fairs in Cambridge and in New Haven this year so that students on both campuses and staff and faculty can see each respective campus's accomplishments. And those accomplishments will induce such memories as this and this and ultimately this, in which all of you exit the class wearing a little something in which you are hopefully happy or proud to say that I took CS50. But before that, and before we serve cake, We've put together, thanks to CS50's production team, and a certain selfie stick, the one occasion that we use、uh, for such things for, when you sent it not only here to Cambridge, but also to New Haven to gather a few hellos from the course's staff and all of the folks you will meet both here and in New Haven over the following months. Allow me to introduce a few more of CS50's staff. Did that make it go? Yeah. Oh, it's going.、Ooh. It's going. It's、uh, gone. Yeah, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah. Nah, nah, honey, I'm good. I can have another, but I probably should not. I got somebody at home. This is Caitlin. That's that's Jay, and I and I'm married. Hi guys, I'm Sahil. Hi, my name is Michael G. I'm not. No, I'm Doug Lloyd. I can't believe that I'm holding a selfie stick right now. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey, we're hanging out at Yale. We're really excited for this semester because it's the first time we're coming to Yale. It's gonna be awesome. Already got all of my love, so no, no, honey, I'm good. I can have another, but I probably should not. I got somebody at home, and if I stay, I might not leave. My name is Jacob Sherba.、Um, I'm excited to teach CS50 because、uh, I think it brings computer science to people in an approachable way. I'm really excited to teach CS50 because I took the class last year, and it's one of the best classes. Yeah, my advice is you should take CS50. I chose CS because I think it's a fun and creative way to solve problems in an analytical way. Back when I was a little freshman and afraid of computer science and afraid of like doing engineering and stuff, it was the first like hard class I took. It was also my favorite class ever.、Uh, this is my ninth year teaching CS50. That makes me sound so old. There's always something new. There's always something exciting. There's always new challenges faced by new students, and it's fun to help them to experience those challenges with them and help them solve their problems. When I first learned how to do CS, it was like learning a superpower, and to see that in other students and to help them through that process has been one of the most rewarding things I've done at Harvard. I chose CS because in the beginning I was a math class afraid, and I took CS50 and fell in love with it. I also felt that with CS I could feel things, and that I thought was a really cool aspect. Some advice for new students is go to office hours and hang out with the awesome TFs. Start your pizza early. Go to office hours. Oh yeah. Your TFs. Yeah. Everything she said. <laughs> Don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Start your pizza early.、Um, 
it's a big social experience. Make a lot of friends this way. <laughs> go to section, it's fun. I mean, go for it. It's really hard. You'll get out of it what you put into it. Um, but it's a really fun class, especially if you're willing to like put the time into it. But it helps you put the time into it. You'll get a lot more out of it later on. I'm Mike. I'm Camille. I'm Hania. I'm Matt. I am Peter. I'm Philip. I'm Patrick. I'm Rob Bowden. My name is Skaz, and this is CS50! At you! At you! That's it for CS50! We will see you from Yale on Friday, Puzzle Day on Saturday, cake is now served! This is CS50!